Okay, let's officially start. Welcome and bienvenidos to today's workshop, Understanding Demographic Data, a Practical Guide to Using Data Share. I'm Crystal Caballero, one of the local consultants, along with Nicole Young and Nicole Lezen, who facilitates a countywide initiative called Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or CORE Investments, which is a collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan of Santa Cruz County. We are co-facilitating today's workshop, Understand, Understanding Demographic Data, a Practical Guide Using Data Share with Eva Holt from Data Share Santa Cruz County. Today's session is held um, in English with Spanish interpretation. Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now and will also translate written comments and questions. Soon we will switch to simultaneous interpretation provided by Stella Lauerman. Hey, as I shared, I'm one of the consultants that facilitates a countywide initiative called Core Investments. Core stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And the mission of Core is to inspire and ignite collective action to ensure Santa Cruz County is a safe, healthy community with equitable opportunities for all to thrive and experience these eight interconnected core conditions for health and well being. And when we say equitable health and well being, we mean that people's opportunities and quality of life aren't predictable for better or for worse by their race, race ethnicity, income, gender identity sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, or other social identity. We partner with other organization and groups like DataShare to align our efforts so that we're working towards common goals. And with that, I'll pass it over to Eva. Hello, good morning. I'm happy to be here today. Um, my name is Eva Holt, and I'm a consultant who runs the Data Share platform. Well, we're actually collaborative, so I wouldn't say I run it, but <laughs> um, for those of you who are less familiar with Data Share, it's an interactive data platform with over 400 indicators from local, state, and national sources. We have updated versions of all data and reports. We aim to have the most current information. And data share is uh, constantly changing with new indicators being added. It is the central hub of information that creates alignment in our county by allowing everyone to measure outcomes with the same metrics and indicators. And we also get to integrate local data sets such as the safety net clinic utilization data, that has previously not been easily available to the public. We know that data share is used by many different kinds of community members, including students, researchers, advocacy groups, program evaluators, grant writers, and fundraisers. Thank you, Eva. So before we dive into the content today, we want to just give you a roadmap of where we're going. Um, so our goals for today are to define demographic data and its importance in various fields, to identify and dive into the key sources. What are some of the key sources of demographic data? We'll learn and practice how to effectively use data share to access and analyze demographic information. And we'll also practice together interpreting demographic data and helping in, in how we can use that data to inform decision making and program development. Thank you everyone for uh, introducing yourselves in the chat. We love to learn about you. And if you haven't had a chance yet, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. To learn a little bit more about you as well, we have a poll, a warm up poll that Nicole will launch shortly here. We have three questions. One, what is your reaction to the words demographic data? How comfortable are you with finding demographic data? And how comfortable are you with using demographic data? So we'll just give you a moment to fill out those polls and kind of see where we are today.
You know, maybe we'll give it like 10 more seconds to give folks a chance to answer and then I'll end the poll. I'm going to end it in five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. Awesome. Great. We see, uh, looking at your answers here, uh, many of you are more comfortable or your reaction is not, is, is more positive to the words demographic data. Um, some comfort, comfort finding demographic data and also using it. So as we move forward in the presentation today, uh, we look forward to learning from you as well. Thank you all so much for sharing where you are today. Ooh. With that, we'll pass it to Nicole to get us started. Great. So I'm going to provide a, just a little bit of <clears throat> context before we take a look at data share and practice um, thinking about how to interpret data, just starting with defining what we even mean by demographic data when we use that term. So think of demographic data <clears throat> as information about the characteristics of a population. So things like race and ethnicity, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, tribal affiliation or education level, income, geographic location. So it could go on and on, but like all those kind of ways that we think about <clears throat> different qualities or characteristics of uh, people and places are what we mean by demographic data. Sometimes we call these identity data or dimensions of diversity <clears throat> or equity dimensions. But the main value or main reason why we uh, wanted to find this and, and spend time learning about and thinking about how we use demographic data is that it can be used to understand population trends, to analyze social and economic patterns, and then inform policy decisions and advocacy actions. And so ideally, demographic data are used in ways that advance diversity, inclusion, representation, and equity. Uh, data can help us understand, <clears throat> excuse me, and describe strengths and challenges, as well as disparities or differences in both opportunities and outcomes within and across communities and within and across groups of people. And it helps us understand who's most impacted by inequitable policies and practices so that we know what to change. Um, so again, all that helps inform <clears throat> things like program design, strategies, policies, and so on. And on the next slide, you'll see a couple examples of data visualizations. So charts, graphs, maps, different ways that data are displayed. And we wanted to show these as we're giving, just kind of making a statement or a reminder about we just always have to be mindful and aware of how demographic data can be and has been used for good, as well as how it can be and has been used in ways that have negative impacts, whether intentionally or not. So for example, uh, demographic data can be useful for identifying trends over time, changes um, or shifts over time. And that can help with developing forecasts or projections about future needs and the implications of trends. So if you look at the chart on the left, for instance, that shows that the rate of deaths in the United States is expected to exceed or be greater than the birth rate by the year 2038. So not that far away. <laughs> Uh, and really what that tells us is that, you know, our, our country's population is aging, you know, we might already know that, um, and that there's a growing proportion of older adults at the same time as declining birth rates. So fewer babies being born, fewer kids. Uh, <clears throat> and so again, that, that kind of demographic data can be used for good, for social good, to help ensure that we have the policies and programs and what we call the social infrastructure, like programs and supports to, uh, that are available to older adults as they age. 
Um, but there's also the potential for data like this to be used for more negative or harmful purposes, like trying to kind of create a narrative that um, supporting young children and families becomes less important over time because really we have to focus on supporting older adults. And I'll just say like, this can happen and it does happen, right? With any issue or cause that people really care deeply about and are advocating for, it's not just about, you know, age. Um, but what happens is that it creates this zero sum game, like that, you know, one group of people has to lose something in order for another group to benefit. So instead of using demographic data to perpetuate that kind of zero sum thinking, we can instead use it to ask different questions that lead to different solutions. So asking questions like, well, why is the birth rate declining? What are the underlying reasons or root causes that might be contributing to people having fewer children? And what are the long-term implications if that pattern actually does continue or does happen in this way? Um, you know, what are the ripple effects on things like enrollment in public schools and which then affects funding for public schools? So it's like, if we think further out, right, we can really think about, okay, so then what can or should be done now or sooner rather than later. And demographic data can also help us understand other trends like seeing how the population is becoming increasingly diverse. You know, we can see shifts in racial and ethnic demographics and how populations are growing in concentrated areas like urban areas, which that again leads to changes in things like housing patterns and infrastructure needs like roads and water and all those other, you know, public services that we rely on. Um, but just like the other example I just gave, we also know that these same kind of demographic data can and have also been used intentionally to justify things like discriminatory policies, like segregation and redlining, where, you know, historically banks and lenders denied home loans in certain neighborhoods that were deemed undesirable, which primarily affected communities of color. And we're still seeing and experiencing the impacts of policies like that, even though they were created and then disbanded several decades ago, like we're still seeing the results um, in our policies and our systems uh, of data being used in that way. Uh, or gerrymandering is an example where, you know, <laughs> in terms of drawing the, the boundary lines of, uh, you know, electoral districts, like that that's often manipulated using demographic data, really just to benefit, you know, particular, whether it's a political party or group. And again, that's uh, demographics are, are used to do that. And so that's how we end up with these really odd looking shaped um, electoral districts that <laughs> don't make sense to kind of the, you know, the, the average person. But so just all of this means is that it's really crucial for us to recognize the potential for misuse of demographic data and then to advocate for its ethical and responsible use and to take responsibility as individuals ourselves whenever we're using demographic data. On the next slide, you'll see the, this is a list of some but not all demographic uh, data sources. Um, Crystal, if you wanna flip ahead for just a moment to the next slide, this just shows all of those sources in Spanish. And then you can go back to slide 11. Um, so we're not gonna describe each of these sources in depth today, but instead I just wanna highlight a few general tips and things to keep in mind as you're looking for and then using demographic data from various sources, whether it's these or others. Um, so I just wanna point out that most of the sources on this slide are federal or national sources. And that can be useful because it means the data are collected for the most part, the same way with large quantities or numbers of people. So we also call that, or it's sometimes called sample size. So the more consistent the data collection is, the larger the sample size, it just makes the data more stable and reliable, meaning you can count on it being fairly accurate and representative of the people that, it, that the data are uh, representing. 
It also allows you to make comparisons of the data over time or by geography or by demographic characteristics or groups. And in some cases, like with the census and the American Community Survey, the demographic data are actually collected directly from individuals across the country, you know, using surveys. And then address and zip codes are used to analyze and summarize the data at different geographic levels. And then states will often take that and do their own analysis and share it in different ways. Same thing with counties. And so sometimes we're able to look at um, demographic data down to like a city or census tract or zip code level. That's not always the case though. Some surveys um, that you see on the slide here, like the um, national employment and unemployment statistics or the national health interview survey, surveys like that may focus on a particular issue. Like the questions will focus on a particular issue like employment, health, or housing, but then they also include demographic questions so that the responses can then be analyzed and disaggregated in different ways by, again, demographic characteristics. And so sometimes, but again, not always, the results are then shared or published in ways that allow us, the public, to view them in different ways by demographic breakouts, or we often use the term disaggregating data by demographics to look at are there, again, noteworthy trends or patterns, particularly things that highlight any differences, disparities, inequities that seem to be based on or tied to demographics? In other cases, uh, demographic data from sources like uh, the Department of Education, the US Department of Education, for instance, that's most likely data that's collected at a local level. So schools, school districts collecting that data directly from students and their families. And then local districts are feeding that data up to the state level, which then feeds it up to the federal government level. So just the point is that like data can be generated uh, for, at a federal level and then it becomes available down to the local level other times the data is created at a local level and gets summarized and aggregated at a, at a higher level. And if you're someone that um, works with data often or you're, you search for demographic data often as you're writing grants or doing other types of planning, you know there are, there are a few things that you're likely to find, may have already found, and may even get frustrated by when you're searching for demographic data from various sources. And this, this happens a lot no matter what the source is. If the original survey or data collection method doesn't include questions about specific demographics, like sexual orientation or gender identity, or the answer choices aren't inclusive, then it means that the data just aren't available. Uh, and so that can essentially make a whole community invisible or overlooked, again, either intentionally or unintentionally uh, when it comes to policymaking and sometimes funding decisions. Another thing that can happen is that different data sources might use different names or definitions or categories to describe demographic characteristics, or they change the way that they ask the question at a certain point in time. This is actually happening with race and ethnicity now in the, with the census, which can make the data just difficult, just makes it more difficult to use and describe or to align with your own data collection methods. Um, and sometimes you'll even see notes from, a, from researchers or from the original data source that actually say when there was a change in methodology and they actually advise that you don't use data from like before that methodology change and after that it's just not comparable. And so those are things to look out for and just kind of know like why that happens. Um, and it's just kind of one, one thing that you have to <laughs> kind of wrestle with as you're working with data. And then the last point I'll make is that oftentimes, even if demographic characteristics are collected from the original source, like the question is asked, you know, answer choices feel inclusive, they're still not always publicly available at a more local level. So sometimes you only find comparisons by demographics at a national level or, some or maybe at a state level where you can compare then 
like California to other states, for instance. But then that might be as far as it goes. You can't even find that data broken down by different dem demographics at a county level, let alone a zip code or census tract level. And so that usually happens when the sample sizes are too small to make the data statistically reliable. So just meaning that you know, a small change in numbers from one year to the next could make it look like there was a large swing either up or down in the results or percentages, which may not actually be an accurate reflection of changes happening in community, like kind of really distorts the, you know, if you're, if you imagine the chart being a, a line chart, it can really create these you know, big hills or big valleys in data that may or may not actually um, be a, tr you know, an accurate reflection of changes that are happening. So again, showing on slide 12, these, these names of data sources are listed in Spanish. We want to show that again, Crystal. And again, just want to acknowledge that these are just a few of the many sources of demographic data available. Um, depending on your specific needs, you may also want to consider data from other state or local government agencies, private organizations, academic institutions, or even international organizations, depending on the type of work you do. So I wanted to pause for a second and just see, are there any other sources that anyone uh, goes to or uses often that you think should be added to this list or that you just wanna give a shout out to? There are other sources that are your favorites. You can either put them in the chat or Come off mute and you can say it out loud. Okay. Oh, Healthy Places Index. Thank you, Tamara. Yeah, and so there's some great sites also that do some of that work for you. And actually that's partly what uh, Eva's going to show us in a moment, like kind of do the work to like take those demographics and help us make meaning of them. Like that will, you know, give us different ways to sort that information or, you know, view it at a state level or drill down to a more um, granular geographic level. So Healthy Places Index is a good site. If anyone else has other sources, feel free to put them in the chat, but I'm going to uh, pass it on now to... Eva, who's going to tell us more about demographics available on DataShare. Thanks, Nicole, for that framing and overview. Super helpful. And there is <clears throat> just so much, so much data. Um, so I think um, it can be really overwhelming. And to know which source is the one you should go to, um, which is going to be the most updated and have... Um, the key indicators that are going to be most helpful to frame your work in a particular moment in time. And the goal for DataShare, you know, to be the repository, this library of indicators for our community is so that you don't have to do as much late work. That's, we're trying to um, lighten the load on, um, on the capacity you need to have to have a clear data picture. And demographics are not about um, that granular data that you would see with your clients um, exactly. And um, so they are really about that bigger frame. Um, and the program data that you use can support that bigger frame or make a distinction between. Um, and you know, the we have a demographic dashboard on data share, which I think gets buried sometimes under some of the tools. And uh, when we were introducing ourselves in the chat, um, I wanted to like step in and, and say like, I'm here because there's been a request from community members on just basic demographic data. And um, we have this available at your fingertips at all time. You can always reach out and send me an email or a text or however your best way to communicate is. But um, the idea is that you can have this as a reference point and that you don't have to go to 20 different sources to have that overview. Um, and so that these indicators are available to the general public. 
And the problem that we're trying to solve with this demographic dashboard has been to reduce the difficulty in finding reliable and accessible data from various sources. Um, so it helps us compile data um, all in one place. And it has a few different features. Um, it provides basic demographic information about the community, um, which cover topics uh, for our population, like population characteristics, education, poverty, housing. And the source for our demographic dashboard, which is what we'll focus on for the rest of um, our session today, um, is a company called Cler Claritas, Claritas, Claritas. Um, and Claritas um, employs proprietary formulas and methodologies to calculate the current year estimates, estimates and five-year projections. Um, so this is a data package that DataShare invests in um, to be able to provide these different categories and um, framing an overview. So it does provide, the package provides annual demographic data um, that is more detailed and up to date when you compare it to the Census Bureau Quick Facts demographic dashboard. So you'll see that there is um, some differences between the US Census um, Bureau Quick Facts and our dashboard. Um, uh, what our dashboard is able to do is to be a little bit more geographically, geographically granular. Um, so those smaller geographies offer um, some more targeted analysis opportunities. Um, our dashboard is really an ideal for kind of annual reports or annual check-ins with your numbers and framing um, because it presents a useful snapshot um, for a specific year um, that can be helpful in various reports, um, such as community health needs assessments. Um, and in addition, it provides that comprehensive um, updated demographic data um, compared to other sources that maybe only release, you know, every 10 years or every five years. Um, and the methods used to calculate the estimates um, do change year to year. So um, there isn't a comparison table um, offered on this particular dashboard. Um, it's not encouraged to compare between periods of time. So last year to this year, we just give a snapshot for this year. Um, and that's that's what we publish. Um, and um, yeah, so let's see. So I don't know what the proprietary methods are, so I can't answer questions about that. Um, but I will say that um, the compilation of various sources is part of that methodology and that timing piece. Um, so we buy a package called Pop-Up Demographics, and they're primarily based on the US Census and the American Community Survey data. But there, um, you'll see on this slide a list of a variety of resources that this um, estimation program provides um, or pulls data from. Um, so you can see that um, the data is pulled from public and private sources. Um, any questions here? We're going to hop on the platform next. OK. OK, so has anyone, you can just raise your hand. Has anyone been on the demographic dashboard on DataShare? Not yet. Today's the day. OK, great. So the demographic dashboard, you can find it under data. And then it'll say Santa Cruz demographics. And we'll have a chance to have you explore on your own. But for now, you can follow along on your screen or you can open your um, your chat box and the link is in there if you want to start here. Um, so the demographic data um, module opens to an overview page of different demographic elements for the selected location. So here's the location you select. Um, and you can change it through this drop down menu. Um, and it goes down to zip codes. Um, and the data is organized by different topics. So for example, population, race, ethnicity, age, sex, household income, housing, education, and employment. Um, 
And you can also click on these buttons, you know, to see more population data. Um, we'll click on population for now, and it'll give you a table of all the indicators for that particular topic area. And then as you scroll down, it gives you um, the overview. Um, all of these, um, you can uh, go further into to find out more. So you can click on one of these um, population indicators um, to see the comparison charts and then to see the regional um, charts as well. So um, this is, you know, if your uh, programs are targeting a very specific um, race and ethnicity subgroup, um, this is one way to better understand um, how those groups compare um, or are placed throughout the county. Um, so what, like I just showed you, once a topic has been selected, all the variable data for the chosen location will display. And, um, and then um, if you want to select a particular item, you can just um, jump to. So we'll say jump to population and it'll take you right there to population um, where you can see all the data values, graphs, charts, and tables. Um, the demographic data charts are presented in this vertical bar, horizontal bar, or a pie chart. So you'll see those different options um, and tables. And all the charts can be downloaded as images um, to use in reports and presentations. So you can go up into the hamburger section of each indicator and download the, um, the image. And it will come with the source um, listed at the bottom. <clears throat> um, so when you're reviewing a chart, you can scroll over the section of interest to see the exact number that it represents. And um, you can also remove, um, let's say you only want to see the subgroup by Hispanic and Latino population by ethnicity. You just remove the other factor um, by going and clicking onto the um, hyperlink indicator name. Um, at any point, you can choose the demographic data dashboard up here. Um, to return to the main chart and to see all the data in a central location. Um, I think I'll just say that the way that DataShare is set up, whenever you click on an indicator, it gives you an indicator detail page. And um, it's the same for this. So um, we'll just play with um, households and income. And um, whenever you see, um, you can jump to, let's say, percent family change, um, you can go to these data tables. And when you um, look at these pages is um, where it will give you all of those indicator details. Um, so um, definitely a lot to explore here, um, which I think we will do now. Questions? Um, while folks are thinking if they have any questions, I'll just pull up the slides for our next activity. And again, if you have any, please feel free to raise your hand or drop your questions in the chat. So with all of that background and context, we are going to dive in and do some practice. So our invitation to you right now is to, if you're not already there, go ahead and click on that link to the demographic dashboard that's in the chat um, so that you can follow along with us. Once you're there, go ahead and navigate yourself around so you can answer the following question to the best of your ability. And that question is, based on the demographic dashboard data, what can you infer about the age distribution of the population in Santa Cruz County? I'll give you just a few minutes to explore. If you have any questions or need anything, feel free to unmute or raise your hand or send a message. Um, 
and we will move on shortly. All right. Does anyone need more time to look at the age distribution? Okay. We're going to practice a little bit more after this, but before we move on, after taking a look at that indicator, I'm wondering who has an observation or an insight or even um, an aha moment that you'd like to share. Anything you observed or anything you found? And Chris, I'm wondering, do you have it up on your screen? Um, I might want to show that on your screen so that if others don't have it up on another screen, that we can all see it together and then it's on the recording as well. I'm sure. Bear with me one moment here. No, just put thank it up. You. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Tamara, I see put in the chat, the median age for Santa Cruz County is higher than the state of California. Do you want to share more about that? Anyone else have any observations to share? Anything you learned looking at the age distribution? Yeah. Thank you, Tamara. Looks like we have more older adults and few younger, fewer younger adults. Indeed. Eva's showing that on the screen. Thank you, Eva. All right, anything else to share before we move on? Okay, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and share my screen again with the next activity. So now we're gonna take a few more minutes to practice and deep dive. So again, if you're not already there, you're going to uh, ex navigate to and explore the demographic dashboard, you're going to choose a geographic area of interest. So maybe you're looking at the county or a region in the county, or maybe a specific zip code, the one you live in, one of the ones you work in, your choice. Um, and then you'll choose a data point and explore. So we'll give you five minutes to navigate, choose your uh, geographic area and your data point. I'll let you know when our time is up, and then we will ask for a few volunteers to share your reflections and possibly share your screen to walk us through what you found. Okay, is everybody about done? Time to come back together. We're wondering um, who would like to share Anything that you found, well, your the indicator that you chose, the geographic area, and if what if you found anything that stood out to you. Or maybe you found something that surprised you or was in line with what you expected. Who would like to share? Thank mm -hmm. 
I see you shared in the chat, Tamara. It seems there are actually more younger adults in South County compared to the rest of the county. Having lived in Watsonville before, it didn't feel that way. Would you like to share more about that, Tamara? Feel free to unmute. Um, yeah, so when I was looking at the South County demographics um, in the H group part, um, if you look at like the indicators, there's more people in like the 25 to 34 and 35 to 44 groups than there are in the county or more a greater percentage. <laughs> um, and and then the older older groups old, over 45, the percentage is lower. So that was surprising to me because um, I moved to Santa Cruz from Watsonville this year, and it just feels like there's a lot more young people here. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's a I guess it's a perception thing and probably just how people um, engage in the community, too. Really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. What else? Did anyone find anything that was in line with what you already thought? I'm also curious, is there anyone who looked at something like one of the ethnicity tabs or sex, one of these other tabs up here that ever has displayed? Did anyone look at anything different beyond age? And what did you look at? Well, I did. Um, thank you all so much. I do hope you had got a chance to go into the dashboard, but we'll go ahead and move on. We have a couple more discussion questions to just sort of bring this all home. Um, and I'll share my screen again. Thank you, Eva, so much for sharing the dashboard. So just to wrap up here today, thinking about what brought you here today and why you um, spent some time learning about demographic data with us, we want to know and we want to learn from you too, what are the ways that this demographic data could help inform or advance positive social impact? So maybe tying in the indicator you looked at today or using some of the examples we talked about, like age distribution. What are some of the ways that this data could help inform or advance positive social impact? You can always feel free to respond in the chat as well. I just want to say, I, I thought it was really interesting when um, Tamara pointed out just kind of how data some, sometimes be that um, good kind of checks and balance for us in terms of like, oh, my perception or the way I've experienced or seen something is different from what the data is saying. And doesn't mean that you're someone's perspective or experience is wrong. It's just like, oh, okay, why <laughs> why is that? And there's is there something behind that that actually would be useful to explore further and explain further? And so I thought that was just a really good reminder of um how that can just help help us do better and deeper thinking about what the data is saying. Thank you, Nicole. I see Tamara added in the chat. I was also looking at income by ge geography and race slash ethnicity. This could be helpful to justify increasing investment in Watsonville, which is currently one of the Arts Council's current goals. Yeah, thank you. Was there anything that you found looking at that, Tamara, that surprised you or um, presented something you already expected? Um, it didn't surprise me, but the 
the like median and average household income is is lower in South County compared to the rest of the county. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what I was interested in seeing. Thank you. Maybe keeping this example or other examples we talked about in mind, are there, what are the ways that demographic data could be used to create negative impacts, be them intentional or non-intentional? This is a bit of a stretch, <clears throat> but I'm just like exploring devil's advocate. Um, I'll share screen because I think one thing that I wanted to say is that this is the snapshot of this year. But there are a lot of indicators on the platform that give you a trend over time, so patterns um, over the course of the last five years. For um, And then there's some indicators on the dashboard that also provide that pattern, and one of them is percent population change. So I guess, like, looking, I'm not a housing expert, but just because housing is such an issue in our county and state, I wonder if when we're looking at an indicator like percent population change and um, planning, if as people are leaving the county at different rates, so you can see here that the county is experiencing a decrease in population, but that it isn't equal across the regions, um, that I wonder how that might affect housing policy um, to be like, oh, well, we don't need to build as much because people are leaving. But then one of the reasons people are leaving is because of the cost of housing. <laughs> so, um, you know, data is so much about the framing. And um, I could see how that argument could be made to a certain extent. Thank you. Yeah, so important as, as you and Nicole have shared to not look at it in, in a vacuum, but to think about it in a broader context. These last two questions here are also in line with that. So here, wanting to hear from those of you who are here with us today, how, how does some of this data fall into a narrative that might perpetuate harm or harmful stereotypes? Almost like the example Eva mentioned. Are there other ways that that could happen? Maybe in your work, maybe in your experience? Any ways that this data could develop a narrative that perpetuates harm or harmful stereotypes? Um, I can go. Um, the It's just the differences between North and South County are really interesting. And I think um, there is like a, a divide that is perceived or <laughs> between North and South County. And so it could reinforce kind of that divide, which could be harmful. Thank you, Tamara. Does anyone else want to share? And then lastly, thinking about, you know, putting this data to work in, in a way that's within integrity and to, to work towards equity, as, as we talked about and why we're here today, how can we disrupt these narratives when using demographic data? Or how do you disrupt those narratives? What do you do knowing about those divides, as you mentioned, Tamara? or anyone else. This is like a whole other um, topic in and of itself, but um, that we've, you know, touched on in several different previous core coffee chats or trainings. And I know it's an area that I constantly have to practice and remind myself of whenever I'm writing reports or really anything that sometimes um, when we're writing or even speaking, that it's 
kind of easy and a habit to use like demographic labels to describe people. And then it's like low income people or uh, low educated people. You know, so it's like becomes this label that describes people versus the conditions or the systems that are creating the inequities. And so it's like, we all, we all do it. We're all kind of like trained to talk in that way. Right. To like use the, use demographics as like adjectives, <laughs> but then what, it, you know, what that subtly does is kind of reinforce or perpetuate stereotypes of like either people being more deserving or less de deserving or, um, you know, kind of it and can often end up getting associated with like, oh, uh, people who are less educated have lower motivation and only so it kind of like starts to create this narrative of, again, like who's deserving, who's not, who, you know, if, if only they did better, tried better, they could, you know, uh, that they could be responsible for closing the gap between good outcomes and poor outcomes. And so it's, it really is a, a practice and a skill and a habit that um, is, it just, it takes time and repetition practice to like really think of like how to describe, how to use people first language. So people, you know, with low incomes or people in families that have incomes below the federal poverty. So it's like, it adds more words, which is hard when you're, <laughs> writing for things that have um, space limitations or character limits. And yet it's such a, a subtle, but powerful way of, again, really using and describing data in a way that is respectful of the people that the data is about. Um, and so that's, for me, that's been kind of one of my, I don't know, just like growing areas of interest and recognition, like, oh, I really want to, make that a habit and a natural skill versus like having to really, really think every time, how do I say this? I love that. Thank you, Nicole. That's such a good example. Yeah. That people first language and separating people from the systems or structures that we live within many times with no, cho with, with no choice mm -hmm. to do so. Thank you. Did that bring up anything for anyone else in terms of strategies or tools you use or ways you approach disrupting harmful narratives um, and perpetuating more equitable narratives when using demographic data? I'd like to share an example um, building off of Nicole's, um, experience of having to like retrain yourself. Um, <laughs> so, um, I feel like a little bit can go a really long way. And this is off the platform. This is on our social media channel. Um, we do these indicator spotlights. Um, <clears throat> so, when I built this one um, for uh, people who are 65 and older uh, living in isolation, um, I looked at the county averages by region and saw that, um, you know, the the average was 24%, um, but that actually in South County, um, that that average was lower. And so I wanted to uplift that as an asset rather than just putting the narrative out of like, oh, this is the data, like interpret it as you will. And so when I wrote the content, um, I asked my good friend AI to help me practice the asset-based language for this. And I, because I wrote a script for it, right? And it was like still in that mindset, I think that we are so trained to do because we're trying to identify those gaps. And it was really helpful to just think about this um, from a different perspective. And so, um, you know, looking at how the lower rate of living alone in South County compared to the average means that, you know, um, South County is better equipped to support their older neighbors. Um, 
and what are the rest of the experiences that we can learn from um, those residents that are living in less isolation. So, you know, we're not a we're not a service agency. We don't provide to clients. We really share data, but as we're sharing that data, I am always trying to think about that reframing and language. And this is one example that I felt like it was very clear how I could switch it. So not always so clear. And I invite you to join our social media channel if you like. Whatever. Amazing example. Thank you so much, Eva. So we are um, heading to the finish line here, but we wanted to just make sure that there's time for questions. Does anyone have, I'll stop sharing actually, any questions or other comments to add? Yeah, Tamara. Um, I was wondering what parts of the county are included in like the South County region, for example, and if there's somewhere you can see that on the dashboard. Yeah, it's clumped by zip codes that are identified by the county um, health department, and I'll put those in the chat. Don't know them all by heart. Um, and um, I'm trying to figure out a way to make it more visible for people to see which region is under which um, group uh, zip code um, grouping. Um, right now you have to like triple click um, to get into those definitions. So I'll put it in the chat and we'll have it in the notes. Um, and once we figure out a solution for that, um, I will send it in a, in a blast of sorts. And thank you for your patience for that. It is a question we get quite often. So we're figuring out the right, the right way to put it. Thank uh -huh. you, Tamara. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, and I don't know, um, I just wanted to shout out, I don't know, Roxanne, if you're on um, on the line still, but Roxanne is um, a fellow data share platform colleague. So she um, helps with the Monterey County data share platform for those of you who work in the Tri-County area. Um, uh, that is a resource that um, can be really helpful as well. Their demographics isn't in a dashboard package style like ours, but they still have um, the demographic um, data listed. So um, yeah, thanks for being a part of that, Roxanne. I don't know if you want to say hi, but um, just I know there's a couple folks on the call that do work regionally. Well, if you end up wanting to say hi, Roxanne, please feel free. But I will um, hand it over to the team to wrap us up here today. Right. So it's uh, so nice to have all of you join us for this workshop this morning. Um, we've got a couple more events coming up that are hosted through the Core Institute, which again is like the learning arm of Core Investments. So next week, actually, we have a core coffee chat where we'll have uh, presenters from Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center and Monarch Services uh, share some of their current work and some of the kind of work that's happening around domestic violence prevention and response in Santa Cruz County. And that's we're doing that in honor of October being Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And then November 12th, we're doing another joint training with data share and core, um, again, really um, kind of tr trying to make that connection between data share as uh, a really robust resource, data resource in our community, and also thinking about uh, like how do we use that data um, in different ways in our community. And so we'll actually have some uh, guest presenters uh, at that workshop from uh, UC Santa Cruz Institute for Social Transformation, um, talking about shifting power at the table and how we use values-based data and analysis to help uh, help do that. And so that should be a fascinating presentation and workshop. Um, and so we encourage you to register for one or both of us both of those events and stay tuned for more announcements about upcoming Core Institute events this fall and winter. 
and Giselle has posted the registration link in the chat, which is where you can see any events as we add them. And so we just want to, again, thank you for being here today. We want to ask you to uh, please share your feedback about today's session. You can uh, either scan the QR code if you have a, a smartphone with a camera app, or you can click the link in the chat and answer the survey in either English or Spanish. We really do appreciate feedback about every session. It helps us know what was useful and if there's anything we can con continue to improve. Um, and also it's a, it's a way for you to let us know if there are other topics that you are interested in so that we can feature in future events. So thank you to the whole team, Crystal, Eva, Stella, Gisela, um, for helping plan this session and providing stellar interpretation and translation assistance. And we hope to see you again at future events.